Hello students, in this video we'll discuss the method of Frobenius in regular singular points. Let's consider the second order differential equation. A of x y double prime plus b of x y prime plus c of x y equals zero, just a homogeneous equation. Then this OD has a singular point, then x equals x0 is a singular point. If a of x0 is equal to 0, right? In other words, at that point, the effect of the second order derivative no longer takes effect. And you might think about, well, why would I care about something like that? It's important in the sense that this, typically in physical problems, the y double prime term represents the acceleration of the problem. And so in most of the, in most of the mechanical problems, if there's a point which cancels off the effect of acceleration, you're reducing it dimensionally. So that's a singular point. We say, furthermore, we say, that x equals x0 is a regular singular point yeah. if I'm going to divide everything by a of x and we consider b of x over a of x, that's the coefficient of y prime, it's a regular singular point, if I multiply this by x minus x0 is analytic near x0, is analytic at x0. And then also, I need what? I need that c of x over a of x times x minus x0 squared is analytic at x0. So these two conditions over here are the conditions I need to be a regular singular point. And the whole point, now the beautiful thing is that near a regular singular point, the method of Frobenius states that at a regular singular point, the solution to the ODE has the form looks like y is equal to some numbers a plus potentially plus potentially b log x times the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of some numbers a n x to the n plus c1 and then plus some other numbers over here plus the sum n goes from 0 to infinity some numbers over here b also b and then um, let's say bn x to the n plus c2 for some numbers c1 and c2 okay so in other words the solutions always look like power series is shifted over by a c1 and c2 and up to potentially a logarithmic term over here we're going to see in each of the we'll see k and individual examples where i get logarithms where i don't get logarithms and it depends on this these the rate depends on the difference of these c1 and c2 if they're real if there's repeated roots in different situations but this is the method for me so you have the, exactly have this form okay excellent and so now what? And so of course what you can do now is you can sort of think of like combining these two series over here. So how do we can how do we find these values C1 and C2? Well, we're going to use the what's known as the initial equation, right? So let's reduce this to the case when x equals zero. Let's assume that our equation, assume that y double prime, and I'll just change it up a little bit, plus p of x y prime plus q of x y equals zero has a regular singular point where I've already divided by this a and put the a over here and the a over here, right? Has a regular singular point. At x equals zero, just to simplify the equation over here, right? And then that means that p of x, if it has a regular singular point, I can write down two, two expansions over here. I can write p of x over x, p of x is equal to this number p0 over x plus p1 plus p2x, etc. That's its expansion. 
And that's because I know have no I know have know that x times p of x is a power series expansion. I multiply x by p of x, this becomes an ordinary Taylor series. So I just divide every term of my Taylor series by x. And analogously, q of x, q of x has to be q0 over x squared plus q1 over x plus q2 plus q3x, et cetera, like that, okay? So in other words, if you have a regular single point at zero, then those have to be the representations. And these are what's known as Laurent expansions. So these are Laurent expansions of P and Q. In other words, the P and Q have a Laurent expansion. P0 is called the residue of P at x equals zero, and Q1 is called the residue of, um, of Q at x equals zero, okay? And so now let's use our sort of our, our Ansatz equation over here. So our equation now, we're gonna look at Y of the form of the sum n goes from zero to infinity of a n x to the n plus c. Okay, which of course is a zero c x to the c plus a one x to the c plus one plus a two x to the c plus two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so now let's plug it into this differential equation over here, right? So let's do the first derivative of this equation over here. So the first derivative y prime is gonna be what? So y prime is gonna be a c a zero x to the c minus one, and then we'll have a c plus one, c plus one, a1, x to the c, etc., like that. And then if I do one more derivative of this thing over here, I'm gonna have y double prime is gonna be c times c minus one, a zero, x to the c minus two, plus what? Plus a c times c plus one, a1, x to the c minus one, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay, that's a c minus two. Great. And so now let's look at the, uh, I'm gonna to try to find the coefficients. The lowest coefficient I see here is the x to the c minus two. And I know that by the assumption, I can assume, without, since there's a constant over here c, we can assume that a zero that a zero is not equal to zero. Otherwise, we'll just start somewhere, we'll start at a different number over here, right? So I'm assuming that. So let's look at the coefficients, the coefficients of x to the c minus two in our differential equation, okay? So the first thing we're gonna get is we're gonna get a an a zero and then we're gonna have a c times c minus one. That's the coefficient from the y double prime term. How am I gonna get a c minus two in the y prime term? Well, if I do y, if I take this y prime term over here, that's this x to the c minus one, the only way I can get a c minus two is if I hit it with this p zero over x, right? So then I'm gonna get a what? Then I'm gonna get a plus c a zero, c a zero, and then a p zero like that. That's the term from the y prime. And how can I get a c, how can I get a x to the c minus two when I multiply by the q terms over here? When I multiply by the q terms over here, what are we gonna have? Well, we'll have q zero over x squared, that's gonna hit the a zero x to the c, so that's gonna give me a a zero c, just a zero q zero, a zero q zero over there, x to the c minus one. So that's the coefficient. So in other words, all these things have an a, this has to be equal to zero, right? That has to be zero. We would know that the a zero is not equal to zero. So that leaves me with the following over here. That leaves me with the equation c times c minus one plus c times p zero plus q zero. Q zero is equal to zero. And of course we can simplify this. This is really c squared. Well, let's, let's just leave it like this. And so this equation over here is what's referred to as the indicial equation. This is the in, indicial equation. And when we solve the initial equation, that gives me two values of C, right? It gives me a C1 and a C2. And these solutions over here, C1 and C2, occur in this Frobenius representation of the solution of the differential equation. So in further videos, we're gonna state the proof of this. The proof is exactly identical to the case of an ordinary singular point and finding the rays of convergence for an ordinary singular point. The proof actually is exactly the same as the carry along the plus Cs over here. The only snag is that when we have a logarithm in our solution, then that shouldn't confuse us too much because we know from the Cauchy-Euler equations, it's possible to get logarithmic solutions when you do the Cauchy-Euler equations. So that's just sort of par for the course when you have a repeat root for the Cauchy-Euler. And that's exactly the way you want to think of these ordinary these regular singular points is that they're functionally things that look like Cauchy-Euler equations. So for Cauchy-Euler, you have ax squared, you have bx, and then you have c. And so if you divide by that x squared, you have a one over x over here and a one over x squared over here with different coefficients. And so the solutions of the additional equation over here basically reduce to the characteristic equation 
equation for Cauchy Euler equations, for which we know there are logarithmic solutions that sort of coincide with the second solution of the equation, right? So we know that this general form has to be has to be true. And so now our approach is going to be to solve this initial equation, take those values c1, c2, plug them back into the power series, and figure out what the representation of the solution is in different cases. Thank you very much.